Dr. Uh, Charles Darwin published uh, the uh, origins of species, he became quite interested in emotions and published a book uh, on uh, emotional expressions of, uh, of animals and uh, humans. And he was, uh, he was trying to make the, the case that uh, animals express emotions in a similar way than humans do. Uh, maybe the angry cat, uh, the, the, the anxious or fearful cat and the fearful human and the angry um, angry woman and uh, and uh, and the angry wolf or the, the, the funny looking uh, smiling smiling guy with a, with a with the no hair on his head and the monkey um, it was it's a bit of an anthropomorphism approach that Darwin took uh, thinking that there's no real difference between humans and animals and we all sort of share very similar features and this is by the way something that um, that I think as brilliant as Darwin was, was a critical mistake that uh, assuming that animals and humans not only express the same emotions but also experience the same emotions. And I will allude to that later. Um, you're all familiar with the Ekman faces. People have been studying emotions by presenting emotional pictures, by presenting face, emotional faces. Uh, and um, as you look at these faces, uh, you uh, people believe that you've experienced similar expressions through your empath empathic process, or the, uh, and, and you experience uh, by looking at at, a, uh, at an angry face, you might sense also a sense of anger, or uh, uh, surprise, and disgust, and fear, and happiness, and sadness. Um, obviously, we know the, uh, that 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 the, mo uh, that the face is a very much of a of a. Of a a uh, very uh, sensitive indicator of a person's uh, emotions, and we, when you uh, we read uh, when you read people's faces, we sense their emotions, and then we uh, we talk to them uh, using words to, to describe that. And emotions are quite complicated, obviously. We still in uh, today's world we use these kind of facial expressions now very simplified. Uh, we send each other text messages with smiley faces or sad faces, these emoticons, they're very popular. We express our, um, our emotions in these kind of uh, ways. Uh, and, uh, and the smiley face means more than, uh, uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a good way of, of conveying your, your feeling, your state, uh, and, and it replaces uh, larger text messages. Uh, you're familiar with, uh, with probably this, mo this, this uh, movie Inside Out that became very popular. And in fact, you might not be surprised that Paul Ekman, the same Ekman who I just referred to earlier, was an advisor in that, to that movie. Um, and uh, uh, the, uh, the, this, uh, if for those of you who do not, do not know this, this movie, it's, a, it's really not a Walt Disney a children's movie, but however, depicting sort of a little girl with different emotional states and, uh, these, and where everything went, went sort of uh, topsy-turvy and the girl got confused, and, and lots of stressors happened in her life, and and came into uh, emotional turmoil. Depicted here as as if there were little animals living in this uh, um, uh, girl's brain uh, that are that that, uh, that are representing different emotional uh, states. Uh, and interestingly, the blue is the this is the sad uh, little girl part. Uh, the red as the angry one. Green as the uh, disgust. And it's also fear the, the, uh, and, and, uh, and happiness. Colors are seem to be also quite important. Colors have always been used by psychologists to depict emotions. This is Robert Plutchik's Wheel of Emotions, um, that, uh, and, and the idea that there are different emotional states that, that represent um, uh, different, fa uh, different uh, color, uh, colors, such as blue, again, sadness, and uh, uh, reddish, uh, purple, red as rage and, and, uh, uh, and disgust as, as, as blue. There are obviously cultural differences. We know that black is more representing sadness and, and grief. In some cultures and others, it's white. Now, I would make the case that these are not emotions, and we really are on the wrong track. Um, if we think that emotions can be easily represented as any single entity, Maybe a little, a, a little, a little person living in your brain with a different, or maybe a different color. This is not an emotion. This is not an emotion. This is not an emotion. The color.
color red is, is not a good representation of an emotion. If we use colors to represent emotions, I would think this is an emotion. This is a, a picture by uh, Jackson Pollock. And it does, as you look at it, it does create some, a, an emotional state. This is a, an emotion is a complex phenomenon. An emotional state is never a pure state. You cannot get a pure sadness, you cannot get pure happiness, you cannot get pure anger. In fact, I would argue that emotions are, are by nature a complex phenomenon, and that makes it complicated in therapy. It also makes it complicated in therapy to name an emotion. What do you feel? And you can spend sessions after sessions trying to figure out what is it that the person is feeling. And some emotional some, uh, disorders are, are in fact, you know, uniquely defined by the inability to really access the emotional state. And if we actually already, if we can, if we know already what we feel, we don't really need therapy in a way, because we have already a way of knowing how to change the feeling that's often linked to it. So one way of making sense uh, of the emotional complexity, one way of doing it is trying to identify and this is also relevant for therapy, obviously, trying to identify sort of core dimensions that cut across emotions. Rather than labeling every single state with a particular word that is very unique to a particular language and also to a particular person, it makes more sense to describe an emotional state as a point along at least two dimensions in this case. I think there are more than at least just these two dimensions, and I will allude to that. But one dimension, and this is, has been, most emotion researchers would agree, uh, an emotion is either pleasant or unpleasant. It feels good or it doesn't feel good. And in addition, there's the other dimension, it's the realms of thought, a thought and all it, it's uh, an emotion feels activating or deactivating. So as an example, being elated, excited, you feel, uh, there's, uh, you feel highly activated and it feels pleasant. Happiness is, is also very pleasant, but not quite as activating. Um, content, also pleasant, uh, actually a little bit more deactivating. Being relaxed is an example of being of feeling pleasant and, uh, and feeling rather deactivated. Um, and uh, depressed as, being, uh, as an example of being deactivated and unpleasant, and stressed or nervous as an example of being activated and unpleasant. So in therapy, obviously, we, um, we are targeting primarily the unpleasant quadrants and, uh, and often uh, the, uh, the unpleasant deactivated, the depressed uh, quadrant, uh, representing this, this uh, lower left quadrant, and uh, also, also to, to some extent the activation and unpleasant um, uh, quadrants, such as being anxious, nervous. We are all but ignoring, really, uh, two other quadrants in therapy. Pleasant and activated, and pleasant and deactivated. It's actually, uh, it feels good, obviously, and why, 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 need, why do we need to target this? I would argue this is actually quite important. We not only need to, um, need to look at the, the unpleasant uh, parts of an emotional experience, but also we need to uh, try, as, a, as, a, as our goal in therapy, not only to make the person less unhappy or less, or less miserable, but we also need to make the person happy and and, uh, and, and, and and feel feel uh, positive emotions. So there are extreme views in in the emotion field, uh, and that is still uh, happening today. When you read the emotion literature, uh, there are these basic emotion theories theorists who claim that emotions are these discrete intra individual experiences that are caused by specific brain circuits. Uh, an overly simplistic assumption, very similar to these little peoples in, that we have in our heads that are discrete entities. And, uh, and often people are trying to figure out if there are a particular brain circuit that is specifically linked to, to fear or a specific brain circuit that is, or that is linked to depression. Uh, and some people would even go as far as to trying to find a genetic lo lo uh, loci that, that are linking to these emotional states. And uh, I think people are now at the point where they think it's probably not possible to ever identify a particular gene linking to any particular emotional experience. Uh, and then there is the other extreme, a constructivist 
theories, theorists that claim that emotions are not uh, uh, anchored in any biological construct, but rather they are social, uh, language, uh, cultural, language-based constructs that are context-dependent, and they do, not, they do not have a biological substrate. These are rather incompatible views. Interesting, some of the, the newer scientists I've been working with, they are moving more from basic emotion theory, theorists, much more toward constructivist theorists uh, throughout, uh, as they uh, learn more about the human experience. And a case in point is Joseph Ledoux, who has been uh, a, a very strong, uh, a very well-known uh, neuroscientist who has been who has, uh, was identified the fear circuitry uh, in the in the brain, and is now thinking that it's much more is probably wrong. We probably have more the amygdala is not the fear center, but rather it contributes to the fear experience. But uh, but this is we cannot link any any particular brain area to any particular emotional state. In our field, you are all familiar with the term emotion regulation. This has been really very much informed by work by James Gross, um, who has defined emotion regulation uh, as the process by which people influence which emotions they have, when they have them, and how they experience and express them. Now, uh, he, clearly there has been a, a uh, he has contributed greatly to the understanding of emotions. He's coming from the social psychological literature. Uh, yet, I, I would argue it's a very simplistic, intra-individual, linear process model. Uh, there's an input, there's a process going on, there's an output. Not dissimilar to Skinnerian thinking, that there's some, something happening in a black box and, we, and, and out comes an emotion. To be a bit more sophisticated in, in what that's how uh, Gross describes it. To say is, there is a, this is actually he, there's a depiction in one of his articles. There is a situation selection. We are able to select what situation we're entering in. Uh, there's situation modification. We may choose to change the situation in some way, um, uh, and uh, we may choose to pay attention on certain aspects in the situation, and not on other aspects. That changes our emotional experience, and then. Um, and this is probably most uh, aligned with, with uh, traditional cognitive behavioral therapy that, that there is also the possibility of reappraising the situation uh, in such a way that we might change the way we look at things and that changes our emotional experience. And finally, the emotion might then rise in us, and such as, you know, we feel uh, increased heart rate uh, and, 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 and so forth, and then there's a way to suppress that and these suppression tendencies have been studied quite a lot, and we know that suppressing, suppressing emotions or also emotional experiences uh, have a paradoxical effect, and as you try to suppress the emotions, they become actually stronger and more unpleasant and harder to control. So this sort of this idea of a linear process, there's an input, there are different processes throughout that, uh, and, and outcomes and emotions. Uh, this is a lot in line with, uh, with traditional cognitive behavior therapy, where we have also reappraisal at the core uh, of the uh, emotional experience. So uh, there's a trigger that leads to um, uh, cognitive processes uh, that then uh, uh, lead to uh, physiological uh, uh, symptoms and subjective experience and then behavioral responses, and they're also maladaptive. Uh, or in the case of psychopathology, maladaptive schemas and habitual uh, cognitive styles, ruminative styles, uh, and, and other things, and attentional processes that moderate this. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a rel relatively simplistic idea, but yet this has been, uh, has been shown to be uh, remarkably um, uh, heuristically useful. Now let me give you an example, but however, I will also at the end of my talk say that this is probably wrong, by the way. <laughs> so, so, but let me, let me now show you uh, an example of, uh, of how emotional researchers would study, uh, uh, would study this phenomenon of emotions, okay? So you are all subjects in an experiment now. Um, and there will, by the way, there will, there will be an, an, a very unpleasant stimulus that will be presented. And one way of, of regulating that is simply closing your eyes. So I will tell you that you should close your eyes if you don't want to see it. If you don't care, you can keep your eyes open. But so, um, 
So you are, you are all part of an experiment, and you are assigned to one of two of three conditions. Before you see that, you have uh, on the computer screen something like that will pop up. The following picture will be distressing, and now three, uh, one of three instructions will follow. So you might be in group one uh, that uh, tells you, as you look at the picture, behave in such a way that nobody could tell you what you're feeling if somebody was looking at you. That is a typical instruction for suppression. Uh, uh, you might be in the, the appraisal condition that uh, we tell you, uh, ask you to, the picture was taken by a photographer in order to induce strong emotions in people. So study, you study the technique that the photographer used to produce this effect. Or you may be in the acceptance condition. Uh, it's a, um, uh, borrowed from, uh, from uh, obviously a uh, so-called, I hate this term, third wave, um, um, uh, Literature, but so as you look at the picture, experienced emotion, it creates openly non judgmental. All right, so now the next picture will be distressing. If you do not want to see it, close your eyes. I'll tell you when to open your eyes. Right, so but this is an example of such a, uh, of such a picture. Okay. Now you can open them if you have, if you, if you have, well, close your eyes. So depending on how you, this is quite remarkable, depending on how. Uh, what instructions you received, uh, we will, as an example here, we will measure Eitling startle, which are very, it's a very robust measure of uh, assessing emotional, uh, the emotional state. So basically, you, you measure uh, EMG around your eyes, uh, specifically your Eitling uh, response to a very loud noise. So you have headphones on, and then a loud noise will appear, and uh, the ref reflexes to blink uh, in response to, the, to, to this loud noise. And depending on what emotional state you're in, this blinking response, the eye, eyelid uh, uh, closing response, will be strong or less strong. There's a typical pattern that you find, acceptance and reappraisal as is associated with not as strong of a response, meaning that you st don't start quite as much, whereas suppression, you start quite a lot. This is interesting in and of itself. Uh, so a simple instructional set can actually uh, lead to fairly robust and strong physiological responses. Um, more ecologically meaningful, however, are probably other situations, not sitting in front of a computer looking at pictures, even though this is prob probably 80% of all studies are doing that, who study emotions. You may also, mm, let's say, examine people's uh, 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 response to a fearful situation. This is an example of uh, uh, when we ask people to give public speeches, or public speak, uh, 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 giving a public speak speech is a very frightening experience. Now you, you can instruct them to handle their anxiety in a different way, similar to what I just showed you. Uh, so you might ask them to, to let anxiety come over you and let it be there and accept it, or you may instruct them to reappraise the situation, nothing is bad is happening, no matter what the person is, well, uh, there's no, there, there are no disastrous consequences following, it's just a speech, it's a reappraisal condition, or you may ask the person to suppress their anxiety, uh, to not show any signs of anxiety. And in a very similar way, having this, uh, giving these instructional set, uh, sets show that uh, um, reappraisal works actually quite well, especially at the beginning, uh, but also acceptance works quite well in, uh, in not experiencing as much anxiety. Suppression does not seem to work uh, well. So suppression has the paradoxical effect of actually inducing greater anxiety and also greater physiological arousal, um, uh, both during the speech and also during the recovery period. This is also true for heart rate, even more so. So heart rate is actually greatest in, already during the anticipation phase and, uh, and, and this controlled for baseline, obviously, and, uh, and, and uh, also greater heart rate during the speech. Acceptance is linked to some construct called mindfulness. Mindfulness is difficult to define. It's a process that leads to mental state characterized, and this is a, a consensus definition that some people have come up with, uh, is uh, characterized as a mental state uh, judge, uh, of non-judgmental non -judgment, non awareness of the present moment, including one's sensations, thoughts, bodily states, consciousness, and environment, while uh, encouraging openness, curiosity, and yes, you guessed it, acceptance. So accept, simply accepting your emotional state is actually quite a quite powerful strategy to deal with unpleasant emotional states. Not doing anything actively with the emotions is actually a, 
a, a, a remarkably uh, effective way of dealing with your emotions. Uh, we've done a meta-analysis just briefly to show you that uh, I, I became, in the, at the beginning I was rather uh, critical toward, toward the concept of mindfulness and whether or not it does something. It clearly does something. Uh, the, uh, just to point out, so mindfulness strategies without explicit cognitive interventions leads to a clear reduction in uh, subjective anxiety. Um, uh, in fact, we saw uh, if you use mindfulness strategies to reduce, in, in order to reduce anxiety symptoms, uh, effect size is 0 0.97, it's pretty strong. And uh, anxiety also is being reduced even in people who, even in, in those studies if, when, uh, that they do not specifically uh, attempt to reduce anxiety, so the, the moderate effect size. And same is true for depression, uh, effect size uh, reduction of um, uh, 0.95. If you integrate mindfulness-based strategies into traditional cognitive behavioral therapy, you also get a very good effect. Uh, and in fact, if you if you look at what drives this effect, meaning what is it that is enhancing emotion regulation, predicting symptom change, or do symptoms change predict emotion regulation changes? The answer is no. It actually is what you would expect that changes in emotion regulation, uh, in fact, predicts at time one predicts changes in anxiety at time two, but change but uh, anxiety at time one does not predict changes in regulation, uh, emotion regulation at time two. Same is true for depression. Uh, so emotion regulation at time one predicts uh, depression at time two, but depression at time one does not predict emotion regulation at time two. Now the effects are not huge, but clearly there seems to be precedence, meaning uh, uh, emotion regulation changes need to happen for the symptom changes to happen. It's not the, 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 uh, the opposite, it doesn't seem to be true. So that led me to a reconceptualization of how I think what emotion regulate, what, what emotional disorders are. I don't think emotional disorders are simply a, 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 a problem with reappraising situations. That would be too simplistic. However, I would think that a, a non-sophisticated cognitive therapist would say just that. Well, you just need to weigh the way, or, or, you know, that is obviously not correct. But if you don't know much about cognitive therapy, but just know a little bit, you would say, well, you just need to weigh, change the way you think. No, no, it's not quite true. It's actually not true. This is not what you do, um, in addition to, our, to uh, having other experiences. But also, um, we, we need to change uh, positive affect, probably just as much as we change negative. So let me elaborate on that. So I think, uh, uh, oops, I'm sorry. Uh, 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 external events and a diath uh, particular diathesis leads to a particular effective style of a person. Some people feel positive, almost no matter what life throws it at them. Uh, and other people have a more negative view on things. The, the, so effective style as a genetic uh, contrib contributors is obviously there, but now I think it matters what, what you do with these with negative affect and also to what extent positive affect uh, uh, is in your life. Uh, if uh, if you dysregulate negative affect so in such a way that you try to suppress it, you don't want to feel it, it doesn't feel good, you don't want to have it, that is a strong predictor for emotional disorders. Dysregulation of negative affect clearly is a predictor of emotional disorders, I would argue. In addition to that, it is also a deficiency of positive affect that leads to emotional disorders. Positive affect and negative affect are not uh, uh, just two points on one dimension. They are not the opposite. You can have positive affect and negative affect present at the same time. Yes, they do tend to um, um, uh, cancel each other out to some extent. They're, they're negatively correlated, certainly, but uh, but certainly people can have a strongly reduced negative affect and still not have much positive affect. You might have experienced it in therapy with a depressed person who says, yes, I feel quite a bit, you know, not, I don't ruminate quite as much and, and, uh, anymore and so forth, but I don't think I feel happy. Happiness is, or, 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 or other, other typical positive emotions that you might associate with, with, uh, with positive affect. So positive affect, we haven't really targeted explicitly in therapy. And I would argue that we should. 
I think I would argue we're actually missing a big portion of what 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 makes life livable and what 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 contributes to quality of life, namely lifting positive effect. Now I'm not a positive psychologist kind of guy. I'm not. I, I, I think they, there are some terms that we can use in therapy, but I think positive affect needs to be enhanced, and I'll discuss some ways how we could do that. By the way, this model that I that I discussed, how it's concretely related to um, uh, to therapy, you might. Um, uh, these are the different components of the model. You could ask some key questions in therapy that give you special consideration in treatment. Um, and we don't have a whole lot of time to go over that in detail, but just to, to touch upon that. Uh, it is certainly important in therapy to examine what the event, uh, what, what is it, what are, what are the triggers that, uh, that trigger the emotional distress, and you should consider past information to explore any recurrent patterns. If something comes up over and over again, this should give you obviously a clue. Uh, the diathesis, again, is based on the client's history, vulnerability factors, and you need to consider the patient's temperament, something called emotional granularity, a concept that Lisa Feldman Barrett has advanced to sort of how fine-tuned are you to emotional uh, differences. And there are some people also who have problems with, with, with coming in touch with their emotions. We call it alexithymia. It's a very old psychoanalytic term, which, however, does mean something in therapy. So people who are not in touch with their emotions, who have problems naming emotions, who, who don't know if they feel, if they, they might feel if they feel good or bad even. Um, uh, emotional intelligence, distress tolerance, these are all concepts that would contribute to this diathesis, I would argue. Affective style, what is the client's typical affective style? Uh, so you, here you should consider problem and emotion-focused coping styles, and, uh, and also what we would call emotional flexibility. Is the person able to shift uh, emotion, uh, his, uh, the, the, uh, experience some flexibility in the emotional experience, or is it always in, the, in one level? Um, dysregulation of negative affect, here we should consider the tendency to ruminate, brood, worry, and then we also have measures to measure that, these are trans diagnostic, and we should uh, involve them whenever we can. Uh, and finally, positive affect. Um, happiness is a difficult term to define, I know. Uh, but uh, vitality, quality of life, these are difficult terms, but they are important for us to keep in mind what is it that lifts people, what makes life meaningful, livable, um, not just not having distress, but rather, what is it? That, what are goals associated with life? And, uh, so here you want to explore these factors that negatively influence the client's positive affect and satisfaction. Uh, if we integrate um, one particular uh, strategy, uh, it's called self-compassion, and I'm, I'll, I'll touch upon that in, in just a minute. If we integrate those kind of strategies that actually target positive affect, to some extent. We get some interesting results. In this particular study, we uh, compared um, uh, self-compassion versus reappraisal versus acceptance uh, uh, for depressed individuals. And it depends on whether they have low levels of or higher levels of depression. If there's a high level of depression, uh, self-compassion actually outperforms reappraisal and acceptance strategies. Uh, if there's a low level of depression, reappraisal, as we would expect, uh, uh, outperforms uh, other strategies. So let me, let me elaborate on this concept of self-compassion. It's actually a bit, I, I think, the, the, um, what we often get in, a, in when there's a new development in the literature, that uh, we very quickly jump on one particular construct and, and think this is the, the key and, and nothing else. And so it becomes a bit of a, we lose sight of the context in which it were, uh, where it comes about. And often it's technique, we would jump on a particular technique, maybe, maybe uh, or a particular therapy strategy. And we kind of lose sight of why we have developed it in the first place and how it fits in the overall pattern. So let me just step back just a tad to explain why self-compassion is important. Um, if you want to read up more, we wrote an uh, article with uh, Paul Grossman and Devin Hinton on why we think loving kindness uh, meditation, compassion meditation, can actually be an important contributor and, and add-on in your, in your CBT uh, for, for clients with emotional disorders. Loving kindness is a, is a very weird term, and, and uh, I try to avoid it when we talk to clients as much as possible. It has nothing to do with romantic love. It has nothing to do with love as we understand it. 
Uh, loving kindness meditation is a very old meditative practice. Some people call it meta meditation, which might actually be, be more appropriate to use. You may even use the term positive affect training, which we have been using. Not to invent a new treatment, but it's less uh, stigmatizing to people uh, that, uh, that, and more accepting, uh, because that's what you're targeting. You're targeting the positive affect. Now, I think there's a lot to it. Here's a, uh, a, a, uh, just, to, to, just to illustrate why I think it's, a, I'm, I'm going to tell you what we do in loving kindness meditation in a second, but just to, um, just to show you, we have a, uh, uh, two brief um, uh, interventions as proof of concept studies. Here we only examined, um, we, we, we conducted um, loving kindness meditation trainings without anything else in fairly severe people with depression. In uh, one group, uh, chronically depressed people who were, uh, who were not just not responding to stuff we did for them, both pharmacological intervention and very uh, intensive CBT. They just didn't move. So we thought, why not giving them a chance? So we did some loving kindness meditation with them. Where my friend Uli Stanje did something similar uh, in people with dysthymia. Actually, we did it with dysthymia. He did it with chronically depressed individuals. We did it independently. We exchanged protocols, and we thought, let's try it out. Two separate studies, small trials. Uh, what is, this is what we did. Um, uh, I'm not going to run through that in detail, but just briefly. Uh, initially, we simply taught them how to meditate, sitting meditation. Just sit there, focus on the breathing, on the here and now, uh, let the thoughts come and go. So first you need to give them a very basic um, idea of what it's like to just sit there without ruminating, just letting, it, letting, letting, uh, letting things be. So you meditate, uh, session one. You meditate session two. Uh, and then in the third, uh, you meditate in the session three, and you start introducing this concept of loving kindness meditation in session three. We explain the loving kindness meditation is now, as you meditate, you don't just focus now on the breathing, but picture somebody that you feel very close to who's very important to you. Not in a romantic partner, but somebody like a child, a, a nephew, uh, or it could even be a pet. Uh, some, somebody who you feel very strong, positive feelings for. Again, not a romantic partner, but somebody who you, you really wish to live a healthy, happy life. Somebody who you might, you might die for, maybe a child. And, uh, and picture a moment with this person. Picture a scene. Picture a, could also be a, a still picture or a, a particular scene that you experienced. Maybe you gave the person a present and the person was very happy and hugged you and this sort of thing. It makes, made you feel very happy. So as you picture this, this uh, hold on to this experience. We call this experience met. Hold on to that for as long as you can. And now, what you do next, uh, this often associated with a mantra, by the way. We say, may this person live a happy life, may this person be at ease, may this person be without suffering. That helps to, to, to enhance this. And now as you feel this feeling, now we ask people to transpose this feeling to other people, initially to a neutral person, then to the self, that is called self-compassion, then maybe to a person who, did, who you had a problematic relationship with, maybe then a person who really hates you, who really, or well, maybe you hate, that's even more complicated. But try that, it's difficult. But wish this person well, wish this person a happy life and mean it. Now it's difficult, but you can go back to this earlier scene that you had with your child and bring back this meta and then transpose it again to this difficult person. You do this in a stepwise fashion. So from session three on to session 12, that's all we did. We sat there, pictured, ima imagined these scenes and, and experienced positive affect. Um, we have to say, Biggest problem with this trial was the high dropout rate. The critical, scientifically oriented, pharmacologically oriented patients really didn't think it's, that, that would make any sense, especially at the beginning. Once they started that, they tended to stick to it. But at the beginning, when we introduced what we're going to do with them, many of them said, 
and how they get you guys are crazy. Um, about 50% is the dropout rate. That's the biggest problem, uh, especially because we also didn't repackage that as, as positive affect training. We call it loving kindness meditation. And also because we didn't include any other strategies with it. However, when we do this uh, with the folks that stayed in, uh, in, one stu in the first study we did in Boston, uh, I just want you to look at uh, the BDI scores. They dropped from 21 down to 3, uh, which is an associated with an effect size of 3.3. Now, pre-post, not controlled. You can't make a big deal out of it. But it's a remarkable change in their psychopathology in those 10 people. It is remarkable. And as you would expect, uh, uh, a, a positive affect increased, negative affect uh, decreased. And uh, we uh, added a few other other scales that uh, uh, that also you know uh, supportive of, of our model that we had. Uh, in the, the other trial uh, that uh, uh, Uli Stange did, uh, not quite as strong of an effect. His were more treatment refractory patients. They, they didn't that it had uh, numerous treatments before, but still a very strong effect size. Uh, they started out at a higher level uh, with effect size of one point. Now, I said earlier, emotions are what you see on the right, not on the left. Uh, emotions are complicated. Uh, we need to focus not only on the negative affect, we need to focus on positive affect. Emotions are also, we you know, by Leslie Greenberg and others, who have, should teach us a little bit more about, about what we do in treatment than we have probably used in the past. Emotions are multi-level. Um, so there are the emotions about emotions. There are, um, you know, it might be the case of of, uh, of a of a loving wife uh, who was married to to Bob for for 35 years, and now Bob dies, and she's obviously sad, and she feels lonely, and she's grieving. But there's also some other feelings to it. Maybe she feels relieved because he's not snoring anymore so much, and she has actually a good night's sleep, and now she finally can go out and. And and uh, and this this uh, thing with her girlfriends, which she never did before, and and, and finally, the, 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 you know, she doesn't have to clean up after somebody who is a little drag, and now the, she feels guilty about feeling feeling relieved. So emotions are multi-dimensional, complex, and hierarchical. Uh, that uh, and I'm going to run through that fairly quickly because of the time. But we do not, we are not just little machines that go around and processing input and spitting out output, meaning emotions. We are linked to other people. That brings back this idea of loving kindness and compassion. We are social animals. We cannot ignore that fact in treatment. Uh, the self is partly defined by, by who we are around others. Uh, we have what we would call a social self. Uh, so we are not only influenced by, by people obviously at the present moment, uh, but also, obviously, people in the past influence us, but I think more importantly, people in the present moment influence us. And uh, uh, I would argue that there's the self has many dimensions. There's a, in addition to this core self that, that probably stays feeling constant in us and changes with, as we change with age to some extent, that discriminates aspects from self to non self, that responds to internal physiological states, that has has lim limited interpersonal aspects to it, we have something called the social self that might be even more important that we need to consider in treatment. So it requires representation of theory of mind, empathy uh, that contains social categories, uh, abstract representation of the self uh, uh, in relation to specific individuals, groups, cultures, uh, and it gives rise to social emotions. Uh, social emotions such as embarrassment, shame, pride, these emotions have not been systematically studied, but they are very important. Shame, very important. Uh, so we would we could uh, argue that de depending on the time where you are assessing people and what uh, developmental state a person is in, uh, the core self has more of an important uh, has more of a role uh, in, uh, in, in in that earlier state, uh, and, the, and as as the person is acculturated and grows grows up in a social environment, the social self becomes more important and, uh, and develops more of a prominence. And uh, I would, one could argue that, uh, that the core self and the social self have different emotional experiences associated with that. Distress as more of a core self response, if you will, and anger uh, and shame much more of a social self contribution, and probably shame more so than, than anger.
uh, if you are interested in what or how we can measure the, the, how emotions are linked with other people, I would think uh, interpersonal emotion regulation as a counterpoint to intrapersonal emotion regulation is important. And so for that reason, we developed a questionnaire. We call it now the interpersonal emotion regulation questionnaire that measures how people regulate emotions with others, through others. Uh, we started out with asking people questions. How do you, what do you do uh, to, to regulate your emotions uh, using other people? Just open-ended questions, did a qualitative data analysis, and then, set, and then used literally thousands of people to develop this instrument using mTOR. And these are the, uh, uh, some uh, factors that we, uh, that we derived. Factor one is people use others to enhance positive affect. That's what they do. We did not have a particular, um, we were not biased toward positive, positive affect as we approached that, but rather we really simply were wondering what do they do? Well, they use others to enhance positive affect. They, uh, a second factor that appeared was perspective taking. Uh, we, they used, they asked others to, what would you do in my situation? Um, uh, in, in how would you see the situation alternatively? Soothing and social model. And social model is another example I just gave. So, um, in addition to this uh, earlier model that I presented, I would argue that there's also high sociality and low sociality as a dimension, in addition to positive and negative affect. Um, again, emotions are not simplistic, are not easy to understand, and the social aspect of an emotion is, is, is just as important of a dimension as, um, as other uh, things. So I would now uh, probably have to end. No, 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 I can go a little bit more. Uh, I would define now an emotion as a multi-dimensional experience characterized by different levels of arousal uh, and degrees of pleasure, displeasure, associated with subjective experiences, somatic sensations, motivational tendencies, motivational tendencies we haven't touched upon. There's a whole new other big area. Uh, colored by contextual and cultural factors, again, the cultural experience is also very important that we haven't all, have also not touched upon. Um, uh, that can, however, be regulated both through intrapersonal, but also, and probably more so, through interpersonal processes. That's why it's important in treatment to not only consider the social context, but perhaps to even bring it into therapy, which makes it complicated. Now, um, let me just uh, go very through very quickly um, uh, a, um, uh, an idea that, uh, that links that, the complexity of the emotional experience with, with how we approach psychopathology in general. Uh, psychopathology is very much of a, uh, as, we, as, we, as we do it now, is we view it as a latent disease model that uh, disease one causing symptom one and symptom two, and disease two causing symptom two and symptom three, leading to high comorbidity. And we somehow assume that there's a latent disease in a person with panic disorder, depression, generalized anxiety disorder, that somehow we assess through questionnaires or through asking them the right questions. Uh, and that is probably not the case. And, and, uh, and the newer models are really just replacing genetics uh, or brain uh, circuitry with this latent disease, and it's not gonna help us much. What we, I think, need to do is forget about this latent disease idea altogether. It, there may or may not be a latent disease that we find, but it's not important. What is important, I think, is more is how these, what we call symptoms, are interrelated. Uh, positive affect, negative affect, social constructs, it, that, that play a role in, in emotional experience. How, the, how are these things interrelated uh, in the, the, let me give you an example. Um, the, uh, so this, by the way, is called complex networks. Um, uh, and and, the, um, and uh, we find complex network uh, approaches in virtually every scientific discipline, including uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, explaining the weather, uh, stock market, uh, how, how genes are linked together, and. Uh, World Wide Web is an example of such a complex network. So as an example, uh, are two individuals, Bob and Ellis, who, have, uh, who show a, a set of uh, 
problems, I don't want to call it symptoms, but symptoms implies latent disease model. So problems such as Bob has sleep problems, leads to fatigue, and leads to concentration problems, leads to field keto edge, and, uh, and both Bob and, and Alice both have a, a, a diagnosis of generalized anxiety disorder, MDD, and, and, and certain things that are comorbid. Now Alice, for Alice, uh, it's a different problem. She feels irritable, that leads to anxiety, and, and uh, if it's a keto, uh, things on edge, and so these, these what we call symptoms, these problems are, are linked and in a different way in, a, in different people. And in a, in a way, in therapy, we're trying to understand how one thing leads to the next and how we can intervene and, uh, and break uh, this causal, causal link. Um, that is, by the way, uh, this is a, 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 a representation of the topography of the network. A network can also shift radically from one state to the next. Alice and Bob uh, might, might have sort of in one network state, it's a pathological state. And as you conduct therapy, often all of a sudden something happens. Something changes dramatically. It's called in the network analysis, catastrophic bifurcation, where, this, where, where as if like a ball from one valley goes into another valley over a tipping point. And uh, once you reach this tipping point, it changes rather radical. That's you often find in therapy, people don't, don't improve radically from session one to, to the end of session, uh, but rather you often experience ups and downs. In fact, this is, this is the norm, the ups and downs. And sometimes the, the ups and downs are, are very quick and radical and uh, extreme. Uh, and you can predict without getting too much into detail, but this is, has been now discussed, especially in the, in the uh, field of um, people with schizophrenia and so forth. You can, do, uh, you can actually predict psychotic episodes from occurring uh, bipolar uh, disorders, uh, manic, manic episodes from occurring, that there are certain parameters that change if you assess them very quickly, very, very frequently, such as positive effect, negative effect, how they're interrelated. Right before the tipping point, there is an uh, increase in covariance, and then all of a sudden something changes, and you can predict, actually, by predicting this tipping point, the beauty is that you actually can, can prevent relapse, you can predict uh, uh, treatment gains, and more. So let me uh, conclude. Emotions are multidimensional context dependent on interpersonal experiences. They are nonlinear, they're complex by, na by nature. We, as a result, we cannot apply a linear model to emotions. We need to apply a complex model to emotions. Um, the, uh, 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 and I think this complex network perspective offers a lot. Uh, emotional disorders uh, should not only be conceptualized as a dysregulation of negative affect, but also a deficiency in positive affect. In treatment, you need to also be concerned about how to enhance a person's positive affect. It may be as simple as including behavioral activation as a, as, as a, as a primary method in, in treating depression uh, in one of, the, one of the components. Mindfulness, loving kindness meditation, compassion meditation, however, offer a unique and very important contrib uh, contributing uh, tool in your in your uh, armamentarium, so uh, I encourage you to consider that. If you want to read up more, uh, I wrote this book on emotional therapy and uh, and uh, that's the end. Thank you very much for your attention.